Okay, so we're just going to do a, just a non-credit presentation. Um, it's just for informational purposes only. Um, if you have questions, feel free to stop me and interrupt me. But um, it's just, we'll probably go maybe 30, 40 minutes or so. Is that all right? Perfect. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Assuming and, everything. And just to interrupt if I get off Janet early, it's not because you're not doing a fabulous job. It's because I have agent visits. <laughs> okay. You didn't fall asleep or anything. I, I'll no, 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 I've never. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm assuming everybody knows what an exchange is, and everybody knows uh, Older Public Exchange. We're a sister company of Older Public Title. Uh, we've been doing exchanges for just over 31 years. And I'm proud to say that we've never had an audit for anything we've done. So um, we've been doing this for quite a bit. Yeah. And we're nationwide. So no matter the properties are being sold and purchased, you know, obviously, you know, I, I can be your resource for that. I know we have a lot of uh, people selling properties in other states and they're reinvesting the proceeds of those sales in the properties here in Florida, our great state. So uh, we see a lot of that too, especially New York, New Jersey, California, those areas. People are reinvesting the proceeds from investment properties in those states and putting it here in Florida. So we're seeing a lot of movement from, from uh, those uh, particular areas. So what is a 1031 exchange? Just a little refresher. So the 1031 exchange comes from the Internal Revenue Code that provides that a taxpayer may sell property and defer payment of any capital gains tax if that taxpayer uses the proceeds to acquire like kind replacement property. And that doesn't mean the properties being sold and purchased have to be the exact same type of property. It can be any type of real property held for investment. So I could sell a single family home that, the, that I've used as a rental, uh, not my primary. So it'd have to be like a rental or something like that. And I've held it for a couple of years and maybe I buy a commercial warehouse with the proceeds. Any type of real property qualifies as long as both the one being sold and the one being acquired are held for investment purposes. And in order to get the full tax deferral on the sale, the taxpayer has to buy another property of the same or greater value. So if I'm selling a property for 250,000, um, I need to buy a replacement property in the same ballpark, 250,000 or greater to get the full benefit of the exchange. And I'm not limited to just one property, so I could buy two. I could sell one large property, uh, and then maybe uh, consolidate my assets into one, um, you know, larger one. Section 1031 of the tax code specifically states that no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment if such property is exchanged solely for property of like kind, and, and which is to be held either for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. So if I have someone selling a second home, it's just strictly a vacation home, which we've seen this, and the property's not being rented out. Or say it's a property that they live in six months out of the year. Maybe it's a Ford investor or someone that you know spends their summers in Florida or something like that. Something like that most likely would not qualify for tax deferment under Section 1031 due to the amount of personal use. Yeah, it's really seen as a second home. In order for it to qualify, it has to have some type of rental income producing purpose. So when we see those things, or if it's questionable, um, I've seen situations where people, you know, bought a property and just they had family members stay there, but they didn't, you know, charge them rent or anything like that. Again, it would be seen as more as like a personal second home type of situation, most, lo most likely not qualifying for the exchange. So in order to qualify for this type of tax treatment, you're just deferring the payment of capital gains tax, you're not avoiding tax. The IRS requires that specific rules be followed by the taxpayer when engaging in an exchange of property held for other lifetime property. And those rules are set forth in the 1991 Treasury regulations that are issued by the IRS. Why do people do an exchange? Obviously, capital gains are fairly substantial. So depending on what income tax bracket your taxpayer falls under, they could be paying upwards of 15 to 20% or more in capital gains tax without a 1031 exchange. That's thousands of dollars uh, being wasted on taxes where they could reinvest those funds into something else. Uh, the 1031 exchange allows the real estate investor to transfer to income producing property. For example, um, I had a, a client that was selling a piece of raw land. He acquired it about 10 years ago for 
you know, it was a, a small, smaller investment around 75,000. 10 years later, he received an offer worth uh, 3 million on that, you know, relatively small investment. So he's got options, you know, he had this uh, originally uh, bought this raw land, hoping it would appreciate and value and it sure did. So now he's looking to buy maybe a, a, a single family home, you know, as a, to use as a rental. Uh, he might buy something in the commercial space with some of the proceeds, not sure in the third option. So if you're a realtor, obviously working with that client on that initial listing with that raw land, hopefully you're helping them on the buy side too. So this is one of those things that can help your clients, obviously, uh, you know, kind of maximize uh, their investment game. And it's one of those things that a lot of times uh, the client doesn't even know about the exchange unless their realtor has told them about it. So um, I see a lot of repeat business because, you know, we have uh, our more knowledgeable realtors uh, giving uh, information to clients that they can uh, uh, definitely work with in the future. And the 1031 also allows the real estate investor to diversify and minimize risk to their real estate portfolio. So uh, sometimes people might do an exchange because the property that they're getting ready to sell, you know, wasn't really generating the income they would hope it would, and maybe they want to move to a more desirable area. You don't have to have a specific reason why you want to do an exchange. There's lots of good reasons to do that, but that's just one way. So these are some of the terms that you need to familiarize yourself with in 1031 exchange if you're new to exchange. The relinquished property, that's just the old property being relinquished or sold under the exchange agreement. And then you have your replacement property, the new property being acquired. Uh, something to keep in mind that the same taxpayer who sells has to be the same taxpayer that acquires. So if John Smith is selling a property, John Smith needs to buy the replacement property. He can't, you know, use his 1031 funds to acquire another person's interest in a property. It doesn't work that way. Now, if John Smith, an individual, decides he doesn't want to own his next property in his individual name, he could actually create a single member LLC to hold title to the replacement property as long as he is the single sole member and that LLC is disregarded for tax purposes, meaning everything basically still rolls up to John's social. So he could uh, do that and still, you know, complete the exchange and meet those same taxpayer requirements by doing that. Same with trust. If it's a husband and wife revocable trust, uh, husband and wife selling under revocable trust, but they want to acquire their replacement property under just husband and wife name, sometimes they'll do that to get a better rate on, you know, a mortgage or something like that. Uh, they can do that. That's fine. Um, because as long as the trust is revocable. Now, if it's an irrevocable trust, that same irrevocable trust that sells has to be the same one that acquires. Now, when you get into LLCs and corporations, if it's a multi-member LLC, that same multi-member LLC has to uh, acquire the replacement property. If they're selling under that entity, they need to acquire under that entity. Same with corporations. Now, we're going to jump down to the exchange period. So, Sometimes you'll have multiple relinquished properties as part of one exchange, multiple replacements. Uh, say I'm selling one, one or two. Say I'm selling relinquished properties. The clock starts ticking on the exchange once the first relinquished property goes to closing. The taxpayer then has 180 calendar days uh, to complete the exchange. Um, but they only have the first 45 days post-closing to apply to identify what property they'll be acquiring under the exchange agreement. And what we do as a qualified intermediary, we are monitoring these exchange timelines. These exchange timelines are set in stone by the IRS, so there's no extensions unless, now we're coming into a hurricane, unless the um, the taxpayer's property has, happens to be in a disaster and the IRS uh, issues some ex extensions due to a, a pending, due to a storm or something like that, obviously we'll follow the IRS guidance as long as the taxpayer has uh, gotten, you know, confirmation from their accountant that they do qualify for any extensions granted by the IRS should we get a storm. And then obviously we would communicate those extensions to our clients as well. Um, but uh, hopefully none of that happens. We don't have to worry about it because we're still dealing with the last storm uh, Hurricane Debbie um, and extensions with regards to those. But 45 days to identify, 180 days to close. Uh, you don't have to be under contract in those first 45 days. You just have to name potential replacement properties. 
Um, and it's a good idea if the client is only buying one property, maybe maybe have a couple of backup options just in case the first one doesn't work out. Um, you can revoke and replace the ID notice as many times as you want to during that 45-day identification period. Once the 45-day identification period has, has ended, you are locked in. You have to acquire one of those properties identified during that time. You cannot make any changes. And the taxpayer also has restricted access to funds. So once the closing on the sale happens, the net proceeds from the sale, less you know, realtor commissions, closing costs, whatever the net is, those funds go to the qualified intermediary. The qualified intermediary holds those funds until the taxpayer is ready to acquire their next property. Uh, if the client starts the process of the exchange and is not able to identify any property during the 45-day identification period, um, say they call us 40 days post-closing and say, you know what, I can't find any properties. I just want to take my money and pay the taxes. Well, because of the G6 restrictions, we can't immediately return funds. We have to wait for the 45-day identification period to end. Once it ends and they've no, not identified any property, we can release those funds, less any fees incurred on the exchange, and they would pay their taxes as if they hadn't done an exchange at all. If the taxpayer has identified property, and change their mind about what they've identified. They have and decide not to buy anything. They have to revoke the identification notice during that 45 day ID period. If it's 60 days post closing and they change their mind, now we're, it's too late to revoke the ID notice. Now we're stuck holding the funds through the duration of the 180 day exchange period. So it's important that uh, it is communicated to the client that they are restricted access to funds and there are only certain times where we can release the proceeds. So uh, these deadlines are very important. If the taxpayer fails to close on any of the properties they've identified during the identification period, it would be treated as if they had not done an exchange at all. And we would release the funds. Uh, we would release them once the 180 day exchange period ended if they failed to uh, acquire or getting any of those properties under contract. So really important information just on this slide. These are the rules. This is how most of your traditional exchanges will go. We'll talk about some other exchange types as well. We'll touch on those. Is everybody okay? Any questions right now? You good? Oh. So it's a horror story. <laughs> <laughs> so so properties being sold and purchased must be held for investment. Primary homes do not qualify. There are separate primary home exclusions under section 121 of the tax code. I think everybody knows about those. Uh, but anytime we have a client, you know, call us and inquire about 1031 exchanges, we ask them questions, you know, this is not your primary, you know, things like that. So you that, you know, have to, you know, go through all that in the com initial conversation. You must use the services of a qualified intermediary or QI. That's what Old Republic Exchange does. So not only do I teach the class, but I actually facilitate the exchange as well. Um, I had somebody ask me that. Um, so do you have anybody in your company that does the exchange? Well, you're you're looking at them. That's me. So, so uh, I, I do both. Uh, the taxpayer cannot be in either actual or constructive receipt of the exchange proceeds during the exchange period. You know, we've had instances where people closed on a transaction not knowing they had to set up their exchange ahead of time. Well, without rule number four in place, without having that exchange agreement entered into on or before the closing date of the relinquished property, you don't have a valid exchange. Even if the funds are still sitting with a title company, that puts the taxpayer in constructive receipt without that exchange agreement in place. So they have to use the services of a qualified intermediary and they have to plan that in advance. Um, and you can't reclose a transaction for the purposes of doing an exchange. I've had uh, people call me up and say, hey, uh, I have a client. They said they read on the internet that uh, we closed yesterday, but they said they wanted to do an exchange and, and, and they, they were told that they could reclose a transaction. That's not how this works. This has to be, once it closes, it's over. Uh, so that's not even a thing. Number five, the taxpayer must identify in writing, remember, 45 days from closing, the intended property to be acquired under the exchange agreement. And rule number six, the taxpayer must complete the purchase of the identified properties within 180 calendar days of the closing of the relinquished property. Hey, can, I, can I jump in right there? Yeah. Just for a second, because um, I think that what a lot of agents need to know is that when you're doing this with a buyer 
or seller, whichever it may be, yes. as, as the seller and then becoming the buyer, if this buyer doesn't get a property of equal value, number one, they're going to be taxed based on their own uh, income level, which is horrible when it occurs. But yeah, anyway, um, but the thing here is that it's very, very good for that buyer to understand, to suck it up and pay more for the property than to pay the tax difference and not be able to move forward with this. So they may be able to increase their offer by 25 grand and still come out ahead. And that's why there needs to be a tax guy involved in this too. Yeah, I agree. I agree most definitely. And it's one of those things too. Um, you know, I'm not seeing so much of it now, but I know during COVID things were kind of like the wild west. But um, sometimes when you have like the, the seller of the replacement property, if, if they're aware that the taxpayer is in, is involved in an exchange and they have limited time, you know, they might jack up the price anyway. So sometimes you have to be careful and, and just kind of watch out, you know, you know, be as pr protective uh, to the client as you can uh, to prevent any situations like that. But it, sometimes that's inevitable. Or they'll do no repairs. Yeah. Yeah. So these are your rules of identification. We have to pick one. Um, they're not interchangeable or anything like that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but now the three property rule, you can identify up to three properties of any value. So there's no limitation on the value, but you are limited to just three. So if your client is on the fence about how many properties they're buying, or they're pretty sure they're going to buy one, maybe two, I think the three property rule would work for them. If they want to buy up significantly in value, um, maybe they want to use the net proceeds from the sale as a down payment to put towards a mortgage and finance the balance. Um, they would use the three property rule. So three property rule up to three properties of any value. So if I sold a property for 200,000 and I want to acquire a replacement property in the 600,000 range and, and use a mortgage, um, I would identify using that three property rule of identification. Now, the 200% rule, you can identify as many properties as you want, so it's backwards. You can pick as many properties as you want. You're not limited to three, so I could pick four or five properties as long as the combined value is not more than double to what I sold at. So, for example, if I sold, say I sold um, a property in the $500,000 range, and I want to identify four lots to develop later, um, I would is I can do that as long as the combined value is not more than uh, a million. So, you know, I sold on a 500,000 as long as I don't go over a million. So whenever I'm submitting my 200% rule of identification, I have to allocate a value for each of the properties being identified. If I over identify and exceed that 200% rule, uh, we're gonna kick that identification form back, ask for those revisions um, before we can accept it. And it's one of those things when you're encroaching up on to your 45 day identification period, say it's day 43, get that identification form over to the qualified intermediary early. Because if there's a problem with the form or they've made a mistake and say they say they submit it to us, um, you know, after hours, like on a weekend or something like that, you know, we don't work Saturdays and Sundays. So say their identification period ended on Saturday, we get it on Monday, there's a mistake on the form, it's too late to go back. So that's why we encourage people, if you can get it over to us early, um, if there's an issue with the form, we'll be able to catch it right away. Um, people have had failed identifications for the simple reason of forgetting a unit number for a condo. Uh, so it's just one of those things, you don't wanna get all the way through the exchange and then mess up on your identification. So free property rule, 200% rule works for most people. The 95% exception rule of identification, no one's really doing this, but we're talking about it here for educational purposes. Um, you could pick as many properties as you want without regard to value, provided that you're able to acquire at least 95% of the value of the identified properties. So how this could go south is, see, I tried to identify 10 properties, but I was only able to get three under contract. That's a failed identification that could end up with a failed exchange. So I don't want to try to get too aggressive and, and pick too many properties. But uh, we had two people attempt to, to apply the 95% exception rule in the history of our division. And both of those transactions failed because, again, people get too aggressive and they really don't pick a feasible amount of property. So we really have to pay attention to those things. Hey, Janet, quick question. 
Yeah. One, if you're still in your 45 day period, can you flip from one to the other? Like you initially go for the 200 and then 30 days. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to switch to the three property. Yeah. So you don't, you're not limited to stick with one role, you know, at that point. If I, if I started with a three property role and changed my mind and wanted to switch to the 200% role, I can do that any time during the 45 day ID period. You just have to revoke and replace your ID notice with a new one, applying a new rule. Okay. Okay. This is just your delayed exchange timeline. If you go out on our website, ooh, excuse me, oldrepublicexchange.com, we have a calculators tab where you can plug in a closing date and it'll automatically generate when your 45 day ID period ends, when your six month exchange period ends, and again, uh, a good qualified intermediary needs to be monitoring these exchange timelines as well. Uh, you'll have situations, obviously, where we're not the qualified intermediary. So uh, we just need to make sure that if it's not, you know, old Republic exchange, that whoever that company is, that they are paying attention to these deadlines and they are keeping the client um, aware as well. These are your methods of exchanging. So the delayed exchange is what we've been talking about for the most part. And this is the most common form of exchange. This is where you're selling first, buying last. Now the fees on a delayed exchange will range anywhere between- Hey Shelby, can I get a refill? Good night, Ted, can you mute yourself? Boy, I can mute. <laughs> <laughs> More coffee, Ted? <laughs> More coffee for Ted. Okay, so the delayed exchange, the fees on something like that will range anywhere between 950 on the sale of the relinquished property all the way up to 1500 if it's, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, anything over a million dollars. So I would say most transactions fall in the 950 range. So anything under 500,000, the fee on the sale will be around 950. And then there's a fee on the purchase of each replacement property of 575 per purchase plus wires. So I would say most exchanges will be like less than 1700, which is pretty reasonable when you compare it to what the capital gains tax would be without an exchange. So in the way um, we work our fee structure, we charge per transaction. That way, if something happens and the client's not able to buy something else, they're not out that full fee. Some uh, companies like ours do charge a flat rate and they get paid their entire fee regardless as to whether or not the client completes the exchange or not. So um, you do want to ask questions about that as far as, you know, how they are charged and things like that. Um, but if there's a situation and um, the client wants us to try to beat or match competitor pricing, we're happy to oblige. Uh, we can often beat and match competitor pricing. And we have higher fidelity bond coverage, so they're getting that as well uh, with our service. So delayed exchange, pretty reasonable. Simultaneous exchange, this is where you're selling and buying all on the same day. Sell in the morning, buy in the afternoon. Now that is a flat fee uh, because we do instruct the uh, settlement agents to wire funds directly from one transaction to the other. So they'll collect our fee on the settlement statement. For the delayed exchange, we'll collect our fee in-house upon receipt of the proceeds. Simultaneous exchanges are usually around 1,500 or so. Um, but the beauty of those is you get your whole exchange over with in one day and you don't have to worry about wire fees. And we can set up a delayed or simultaneous exchange uh, in less than an hour, believe it or not. Those can be set up pretty quickly. So if you find someone is uh, wanting to move their closing up to this afternoon because of the storm, uh, we can set up that exchange. Uh, so not a problem at all. Now the reverse exchange, we're seeing a little bit of an uptick with these. This is where the purchase happens before the sale, but you can still do an exchange, believe it or not. Now, with the reverse exchange, it does require advanced uh, lead time to set up one of these, usually about a two to three week lead time ahead of the purchase. Uh, we have to get the file going. Uh, the reverse exchange, the fees on something like that are a little higher as compared to a delayed or simultaneous because it is a much more complex form of exchange. Uh, you're looking at a fee range of between 8,500 and 12,000 on a reverse exchange. But again, those fees are usually minuscule when you compare it to what the capital gains tax would be. And obviously, if it's a tiny transaction, it probably wouldn't make sense to do a reverse exchange. But on the larger ones or, or most um, even average uh, transactions, the reverse exchange is still uh, worth it for a lot of people. Now, in a reverse exchange, if someone 
thinks they have to do this and say they're closing on their purchase isn't until like the end of November. Well, we don't have to hurry up and set up a reverse exchange. Let's wait and see what happens with their property. If they're able to get their property under contract with a buyer, then we move and do a regular exchange. Or say we start the process of doing a reverse exchange, and then by some miracle, they're able to get their old property under contract and close on that one first, or maybe do a simultaneous close. Then we can always convert the file from a reverse to a traditional or simultaneous exchange. Now, the way the reverse exchange works I'll give you an easy example. If it's an all cash transaction, all cash, all residential, uh, the taxpayer cannot be entitled to both the new property and the old property at the same time. So there has to be a parking of title arrangement. Uh, we have to create an entity called an exchange accommodation title holder. We'll call it an EAT for short. The EAT is the entity that will hold title usually to the new property while we wait for the old property to be sold. So the way it works, if it's all cash, the taxpayer loans the funds for the purchase to the EAT. The EAT uses the funds it borrowed from the taxpayer and completes the purchase of the new property. The EAT holds title to the new property while we wait for the old property to be sold. Once the old property is sold and it has to be sold within 180 days of the purchase, once it's sold, the EAT repays the loan it borrowed from the taxpayer and conveys title from the EAT to our and buyer. So you can do this at, through the reverse exchange. And if the like closing it. falls through and doesn't that. occur <laughs> within 180 days, what happens? Say that again? If the, the closing falls through uh, and does not uh, occur yeah. within 180 days, what happens? If you're talking about the, on the old property? Yes. If they're not able to sell their old property, you know, we would must obviously convey title to the new property and it would be treated as a failed exchange. So they'd be out the fees and they've done the exchange for nothing. So, and that's another thing too, they can even end up, we always tell people too, make sure you have your old property at least listed or you have a good idea on what the, what the you know, you're listing it at the proper price point because you don't always also want to end up in a situation where uh, the old property sells for more than the new property is acquired at. So, you could end up with a, a boot situation if you have leftover funds. So remember, we want to keep it at equal or greater value. If I accidentally yeah, buy down in value, yeah, so, I'm, I'm not only am I paying the fee, but I'm also paying it. Yeah, yeah. So reverse exchange, you know, we're, we're seeing, like I said, a little bit of an uptick in these. And then even while we're parking title to the property, the taxpayer still has access to the property like they would in any other transaction. There's just an agreement between the EAT and the taxpayer so they can still use the property and have access, do what they need to do, that kind of thing. But reverse exchange is an option for people that have to buy first. But, you know, I tell people, once I tell them the fees, a lot of time they'll go, well, let me see what I can do. And they'll try to move the closing date. So we have that as well. Uh, construction or improvement exchange, not seeing too many of these. This is where you're selling your relinquished property and then using the exchange accommodation title holder, remember that EAT, to acquire and hold title to the new property while proceeds from the sale are used to construct capital improvements. Upon completion of those improvements, the replacement property is then conveyed back to the exchanger. So you have to have that parking of title arrangement. Um, so not only do you have to have that EAT in place, but you also have to have um, you have to tell us what property you're buying, like you normally would within 45 days of closing, and you have to tell us what those improvements will be within the 45-day ID period. So you, with that construction improvement exchange, uh, we're talking about major capital improvements, new construction, a new roof, you know, new windows, big ticket items. Now, if the improvements are not completed within six months of the sale, um, again, it will be treated as if it were a failed exchange. So everything has to be done within six months. So, you know, if it's a project that will take a year or two to complete, that would not be suitable replacement property uh, to use in the exchange. But construction or improvement exchanges, a little higher, uh, 9,500 to 12,000, and we would have to handle disbursements at certain phases of construction. Now, if it's brand new construction that the client has already put an earnest money deposit down on, and there's maybe a second earnest money due like midway through construction and a balance at closing, we would treat that as a regular exchange. As long as they're not relying upon proceeds from the sale, 
you know, to make those improvements. So if it's just regular construction and, and they've already put, you know, money down and things like that, we can do that. And they can even pull funds from the exchange account to put down a second earnest money deposit and things like that. Now, in either scenario with the reverse or construction exchange, um, if it's a commercial property, we would require a phase one environmental study that's less than six months old. Because if we are parking title, we have to evaluate any potential environmental hazards because uh, there, there's no guarantee we can handle the transaction. If there's some type of environmental risk or hazard to parking title, we might, instead of parking title to the new property, we might suggest parking title to the old property. Either works, uh, but that's what most people cho choose to do is have us park title to the new. Any questions about the methods of exchanging? No, but what I would say, guys, is don't try to explain this to customers. No. Uh, get, get a professional involved right. that knows exactly what they're doing. You can lay the outline out for them, but then you're mm -hmm. not the you're not the attorney kind of thing again here where we don't want to play that role mm -hmm. because you'll get sued if something goes backwards. <laughs> and we're happy to jump on any conference call. So if you just want to let us take the lead, you know, we can do that too, because we can get some into the weeds with some of these, especially with these reverse and improvement exchanges. Oh, yeah. They get confusing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you miss a timeline, your your uh, buyer or seller is out of a ton of money. <clears throat> and it doesn't bump to the next business day like your contracts do. Right. I mean, if it's due on a Saturday, it's due on a Saturday. Uh, it doesn't yeah. bump. Yeah. And ho yeah, holidays don't matter. If nope. your 45 day ID period ends on Calendar Christmas. Days. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> yeah. Right, so don't do it around Christmas time. Uh -huh. Oh, you'd be surprised at how many people do stuff around Christmas or or right before they go on vacation. What the heck? <laughs> so we're oh, yeah. very convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Forty-five days later. Oh, by the way, yeah. all's on Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, and and a good thing too is we we can do uh, e-signing now too. We have the easy sign. So if you have somebody that you know needs to sign electronically, our documents can be done can be signed electronically now too, which is very convenient too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. What qualifies as like kind? Remember, we said any type of real property that's held for investment qualifies. These are just some examples, single family, except for primary homes for a multifamily, vacant land for a strip mall, hotel for a farm. Uh, believe it or not, in Florida, you know, boat slips. I see people, as long as the boat slip is considered real property via local law and ordin ordinance, you can do a 1031 exchange and sell a boat slip and buy a home. Okay. You know, I, I've so seen... You can do it in Riviera Dunes because there's a small percentage of that uh, land yeah. that they um, apply towards each one of those slips. Mm -hmm. It's doable. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, in or some states. On, on rentals. Perfect. Wow. I didn't know that. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're fine. And in some states, you know, they might have water rights, uh, mineral rights. That's considered real property. You know, it just depends. But any type of real property qualifies. <laughs> Now, property excluded, we just talk about it here for educational purposes because people do ask us questions all the time. The 1031 exchange only applies to real property. It does not include stock and trade or other property held primarily for sale. It doesn't include bonds or notes or other securities or evidences of indebtedness or interest. It does not include the sale of an interest in a partnership or certificates of trust or beneficial interest in personal property. So let me give you a little bit of a history lesson, too. So when the 1031 exchange began and became part of the tax code more than 100 years ago, believe it or not, it, it started with livestock exchanges. So farmers were selling cows. Uh, as long as you had a, if you were selling livestock of the same, same sex, you could do a 1031 exchange. So I could sell a male cow, buy another male cow, and, and defer the capital gains tax on that cow by doing a 1031 exchange. <laughs> Well, flash forward, uh, they eventually included, you know, that evolved from, you know, livestock to tractors to automobiles. And then much later in the tax code, they incorporated real property, thankfully, you know, for our industry. So that was a great thing, we did a great thing for our industry when they included real property. Well, when they did that overhaul to the tax code, remember when they made all those changes back in 2018? Um, as of January 1st, 2018, they eliminated personal property from the tax code. Um, so you could no longer do like livestock exchanges and things like that. We did a lot of boat exchanges in Florida, like commercial fishing charters, believe it or not, and things like that. Um, but thankfully they did preserve real property 
uh, hopefully for the foreseeable future. Um, when I first started teaching this class, I had somebody ask me if they could exchange their mother-in-law under the personal property. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Can't exchange humans. No family members. The property. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so these are just a list of some of the potential hazards. This is not obviously an all-inclusive list. Um, but remember what we said about vesting. We always have to compare what's listed on the warranty deed or quick claim deed or title commitment. We need to verify the same taxpayer who's selling is, is our taxpayer who, who's buying through the exchange. We'll need to make sure the contract uh, matches the vested owner as you know with our seller and things like that. Uh, potential marital issues, if there's a divorce situation, partnership interests. Um, sometimes we'll have situations where Say it's a two-member LLC. Say it's two brothers. They get in a fight. They decide not to own property anymore together. So one brother wants to do the exchange. The other one wants to take his money and pay the taxes. Well, the property is owned under a two-member LLC. But what they have to do is far in advance of the transaction, we suggest a year or more, they do something called a drop and swap. It sounds illegal, but it's not. In a drop and swap, the two-member LLC conveys title out of the LLC into the two individual uh, owners. Now that each brother owns a 50% undivided interest in the property as a tenancy in common tip. So now the brother who does want to do the exchange can go ahead and take his, his 50%, do the exchange under his individual name. The other brother can go pay his taxes. If you do the drop and swap just before the sale, it could create an issue with the exchange. Under Section 1031, with regards to most transactions, there aren't really any type of mandatory holding requirements, but we do suggest holding a property for about two years before selling. Uh, related party transactions also require a two-year holding period, but if you sell a property immediately after, like if they did that quick claim deed from the LLC to the two individual owners just before the sale, it could be a potential audit risk to the exchange due to the short holding period. So. Two years is our suggestion, uh, but if a CPA is okay with a year or less holding or they're okay with the, their client taking the audit risk, then we'll proceed accordingly. The partnership interest can get kind of hairy. Carry back financing, we're seeing a lot of this lately. This is where the, the seller of the relinquished property holds a note for the purchaser. If you are incorporating carry back or seller financing into the exchange, there are a couple of options in doing so. Uh, but the number one thing to remember, if you're including it in the exchange, the note cannot be in the name of the taxpayer. Uh, the note is usually put in the name of the qualified intermediary, and it's paid off within the six-month exchange period. So uh, carry back financing, if not done properly, can be also an issue with the exchange. Uh, repair work. Sometimes people want to recoup costs of uh, repairs they put into a property just before selling it. Any funds that you hold back for repairs would be taxed as boots. So keep that in mind too. Uh, related party transactions, this would be immediate family members, uh, mother, uh, son, father, daughter kind of thing. And non-exchange related costs. Uh, you do have to consider all the non-exchange related costs uh, in, in the exchange. If you're paying off a mortgage as part of the sale, you need to carry another mortgage of the same or greater value onto the next property or replace that debt with cash. Otherwise, believe it or not, your tax on the mortgage boot, the mortgage payoff. So we have to keep those things in mind. And again, um, just you have to consider a lot of things. If there's things deducted at closing for like say rent prorations or pest inspections, those are not allowable expenses. So you could be taxed on them if you don't replace those funds when you buy the next property. So Just a quick recap yeah. on the back. <laughs> so, so obviously deferred capital gains tax, number mm -hmm. one, depending on your income tax bracket, you could be paying a lot in taxes. Uh, the 1031 exchange allows the taxpayer to leverage for wealth building, relocate assets, and believe it or not, the state and tax planning. Uh, the goal for many individuals that are doing these exchanges is they keep doing them until they pass away. And then the property passes on to your heirs in a stepped up basis. So all that tax is forgiven and your heirs receive the property at whatever the fair market value is at the time of your death. So they can do exchanges. So uh, a lot of people do uh, consider the 1031 in, in, into their estate plan. So definitely... Um, I don't know if, if uh, Ian, if the law firm there has any estate planners on, on staff, but 
definitely talk to them about that. This is what we do. I hope everybody likes my little baby down there. It's pretty cute. Oh. <laughs> so, so we act as a qualified intermediary as required by the treasury regulations. This just means that we acquire the relinquished property from the taxpayer and transfer it to the buyer. And we acquire the replacement property and transfer it to the taxpayer. We prepare all documents necessary for the exchange. So when, when you're working with qualified intermediaries, ask what documents they're preparing um, just to kind of help your client along. Uh, we do the exchange agreement, all the assignment agreements on both the sale and the purchase. Uh, we consult with the exchanger's tax advisor. We're happy to jump on a call with their CPA. Uh, we execute closing documents as principal, as seller in the relinquished closing, and as buyer in the replacement closing. So the settlement statement will show something like Old Republic Exchange as qualified intermediary for John Smith, because we can never show John Smith re receiving the funds. Um, we hold the funds to prevent the taxpayer from either actual or constructive receipts. And we coordinate with closing agents, real estate agents, tax and legal advisors. So we're pretty much a one-stop shop. Even if you need me as just a, you know, somebody to, you know, bounce questions off of, you could be working with another qualified intermediary, uh, but maybe something that they're doing isn't setting right in your gut. Maybe you're finding an issue with, with, with how they're, they're doing something with the exchange. We can tell you what we would do in the same set of circumstances. However, unfortunately, our industry is not regulated like the title industry is. So um, we can tell you what we would do in the same set of circumstances. So if it's deviating from any of the roles that we're talking about today, um, I would definitely bring it to your client's attention. But um, I'm here as an educational resource too. But when selecting an intermediary, you do have to be very cautious. You have to make sure they're, they're in compliance with section 1031. Remember what we said earlier, you have to have that exchange agreement in place on or before the date of the closing on the sale. If you don't have that exchange agreement in place, you don't have a valid exchange. So we do have to make sure that is all planned for in advance of the closing. Uh, you have to look at the financial security and experience of the company handling the exchange. Uh, Old Republic Exchange's parent company is Old Republic International. Warren their New York Stock Exchange is ORI, which is a multi-billion dollar corporation that has 25.1 billion in assets. Old Republic Exchange also carries a $50 million errors and emissions policy. We have the highest fidelity bond coverage in the industry at $120 million. And the fidelity bond covers acts of dishonesty or fraud. For added security, we will also issue a letter of guarantee, which indemnifies the taxpayer against loss should something go wrong with the exchange. Now, that letter of guarantee does not indemnify against bank failure but that's why we only use FDIC insured pooled trust accounts to hold funds. So the funds are never invested or anything like that. So if anybody ever needs to see evidence of our errors and emissions and fidelity bond coverage, or they need that letter of guarantee, we're happy to provide those uh, items uh, upon demand. So, um, but definitely want to make sure that the company, you know, is experienced because if you refer somebody to a company and they don't know what they're doing, then it could come back to you. So you do want to be very cautious. Uh, and that's just my contact information. And that's my face. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then if you um, want to download, um, you know, click on the little QR thing, you can uh, download my contact information. And I respond to text message too. So if you just have a quick question and, you, and you're in a meeting or something like that, you can just shoot me a text and I will respond. And then if you uh, want to follow us on LinkedIn or, or Facebook, we do have our social media pages that always have a plethora of information. So if you want to stay on top of all things exchange, uh, definitely follow those pages. And I think especially now is important to follow our pages because of this upcoming storm. So, you know, if there's any, you know, any issues or or the IRS does grant any extensions, we'll, we'll be putting those on our social media channels as well. And then, um, like I said, if you, there's never like a consultation fee. I don't know if other companies do that, but like you could, ha I have people that will call me every day for six months until their property goes under contract. I'm here. So if you have questions or anything like that, you know, call me.